Today, I'm really excited about the guest I get to talk to. He is an author, a speaker. He was a pastor. He's a musician, extremely creative, but currently he is a coach and public speaker as well. And so I got to tell you the reason why I'm excited is because this guy is kind of like the future version of myself that I've always envisioned. And so it's really awesome to get to speak with people who are where you want to be. And so in this interview, we get to talk to Brent Menzoir with a pirate R on the end of it. Brent, how are you today? Thank you for coming. I'm doing, great. Yeah. doing great, brother. Thank you so much for that intro. I love it. You bet. Well, for starters, I just got to say, I love your background. Are you a, I'm guessing you're a musician based off of how many guitars you have. Uh, 20 years in the music business, two record deals. That, that's, that's my background, man. That's where I came from. Uh, two different bands uh, toured with, uh, the first band was Fort Pastor in the Christian market. So we toured with all of the Jars of Clays and Third Days and Toby Max and that crew. And, and then a uh, second band in the general market called Big Kettle Drum and have toured with Big Kettle Drum for the better part of uh, 10 years now with some former members of Fort Pastor. And uh, yeah, man, 20, 20 years in the music business, traveling all over the world, getting a chance to, to play music for a living. It's been pretty amazing. That's awesome. Are you, are you familiar with the band Pillar? I am. Did you ever yes. play with them? I have, yes. I've yeah. played several, several uh, uh, festivals with Pillar. Yeah. Uh, so I'm good friends with Mike Wittig, who is oh, the bass player. Anyway, side note. Yeah, yeah. But man, I wanted to have you on because you just recently came out with a book and I, I want to hold it up here. It's called Black Sheep and one just really cool designs. Mm -hmm. But when I, when I saw this, it, it kind of really connected with my heart in the way that I've always felt like a black sheep. I've never felt like I fit in, whether it's from my upbringing to my own career. I've always felt separated with a purpose, but yet with that purpose or that calling, I feel like it goes unfulfilled. And so your book is a, a lot about what it means to stand out and you know the different lies of purpose and calling. And I just wanted to hear from you, just kind of give us an overview about your book. Sure. Uh, I was 47 years old a few years ago um, when somebody finally took the time to explain to me why black sheep are not valued like the rest of the flock by farmers. Uh, and I was so blown away by the truth because I had lived four decades before somebody actually told me the real reason. And the real reason is because a black sheep's wool cannot be dyed. So every black sheep is 100% authentically original and can't be changed into something that it wasn't designed to be. And so that, when I heard that, I'm like, that's literally uh, my life's goal. And uh, I believe uh, how God designed us all uh, to be that 100% authentically unique creation. And so I believe we possess five black sheep values. These are these deeply held personal core values that no matter how much someone wants to try to influence or change them, they simply will not be moved uh, like a black sheep's wool. And so the book helps you identify what your flock of five are, helps you prove that they are indeed your sheep and that you are not caring for someone else's, and then teaches you to speak them into existence, choosing when and where they appear in your life, in your calendar on a daily basis. That's, so, that's what the book does. Are these five points individualistic or are they uh, completely printed out in, in your book? No, these are five things that you need to discover, uh, five different values that you need to discover for yourself. So the book gives you a couple different ways to do it. Uh, there's an online assessment that is free that anybody can take that helps you get the conversation started. You can simply go to findyourblacksheep.com, click on find your flock, and it's going to present you with 125 commonly held personal core values and ask you to just quickly read them and any word that is really important to you, go ahead and select it. And so what we know after a couple of years and thousands of thousands of people who have taken the assessment is that the average person selects at least 30 words. These are 30 values that are really important to them. Well, when there are 30 things that are really important to you, there is nothing 
that is really important to you because there's no way for you to honor all of those things on a daily basis, which is what you have to do if they're truly your non-negotiable black sheep values. They have to be addressed every day, all of them. And so the idea is let's take that subset of 30, 40, 50 words, however many you chose. We group them by likeness into five different buckets. So things like empathy and sympathy go in one bucket, things like achievement and success go in another bucket. And before you know it, you've got five different buckets of words. You can choose one word from each bucket. What is the one word you cannot live without? It is your non-negotiable. That gets you to your initial flock of five black sheep values. And then we have to go about the process of proving that they're real. Awesome. So in life, there's a lot of distractions as you were saying, you know, you start off with like 30 words Mm -hmm. and then you have to narrow it down. You know, you have a process of doing this and and let's say hypothetically someone never heard of you or heard Mm -hmm. of this process. Mm -hmm. How would someone like me go about learning how to find my purpose or calling on what Mm -hmm. I was created to do? Well, the first thing I was going to tell you that you're never going to find it. It's not something you find. It's something you choose. And so if you're looking for it, you're looking in the wrong place. (laughs) You've got to choose it. And the only way that you can choose one that is in alignment with the things that matter most is to discover the things that matter most. And so there's, there's, look, there's lots of different ways to go about doing this. Uh, Maslow uh, would describe these sorts of events that define these values as peak experiences. And you could take the long road, which would be to go back over the course of your life to the most important moments in your life, good or bad, and look at what those moments were comprised of. Um, most of us don't want to take that route. It is a deeply personal a uh, difficult route where sometimes we're looking at events that uh, weren't necessarily positive. And so there's a lot of struggle. There's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of hurt. Sometimes these black sheep values are born out of very negative experiences, things that we go, I never want that to happen again. I never want to be like that person. Um, so the idea is there's several different ways that you can do it. What we try to do is, is develop this um, short assessment that allows you to dip your toe in the values pool and start the conversation. It is not designed to provide you with with 100% truth. It is designed to start the conversation and it's going to take weeks, months, if not years to really prove what your non-negotiables actually are. Mm. So in terms of, before we get to the figuring out what the non-negotiables were, you know, you said something that I really, really liked, but it, it, it's making me question, why is that the case? Which is, you said, if you're trying to find your purpose or you're trying to find your calling, you're never going mm-hmm. to find it because it's not right. there. Would you expound on that? Because, you know, yeah. our audience knows that I've been wanting to be in vocational ministry for years. Mm-hmm. At seven years of age, I felt called. I've gone through many church plants, m- many helps, as much as I could. And everything just seemed to fall apart to where Mm -hmm. I gave up. I don't want to do it, but yet I still have this hunger and this burden to do so. And I believe God's doing it in different ways. And, you know, this can be considered a ministry, but in general, Mm -hmm. if you don't find your calling, then how do you come to recognize it? Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think there's a couple of different factors to what you just said. For me, uh, I believe that, that these black sheep values are what God puts in us to be those things that make us unique. They are the really literal fabric of who we are. You know, each one of us is a unique creation. There's no one that has the same set of fingerprints, right? I mean, that we are all unique in, in his creation. And so, what I'm going to tell you is that the reason that you have felt that way is because you're winging it. Um, until you discover these things that are your non-negotiables, you're winging it in life. And it's one of the most difficult realities to accept, especially especially if you've been successful in any way, shape, or form. The more success you have while winging it, the less motivation there is to actually get your stuff together and figure it out. Mm-hmm. So the idea becomes... 
it's not that you don't have a purpose. It's that it's not meant to be found. It's meant to be chosen. And it's chosen out of the things that God places in you that are the most important things, the very reasons why you feel that you are placed on this planet. And so the idea is you have to start with what if you're going to get to your why. If you try to start with why first without defining the what, they will never be in alignment and it's just not going to be true. So if you're trying to live out a purpose that isn't actually accurate, guess what? It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. So you've got to start with what? Define these things that make you that 100% authentic original that God created. And then out of those, choose your purpose. I'll give you an example. For myself, my flock of black sheep values, creativity, hope, impact, empathy, family, authenticity. Every decision I make in my life gets filtered through those six things. I have an extra, right? I say we have a flock of five, but I have one more. Um, and so for me, my purpose, my purpose was chosen based in these values. So my purpose is to creatively impact others by authentically providing hope. If it sounds familiar, it's because it's loaded with my black sheep values. My what and my why are now in alignment with each other. And when those two things are in alignment, it allows the how I'm going to honor it to be incredibly adaptable and resilient. But when they're misaligned, we never get to see that success because the only time we experience it is by accident or luck. And that is not how you ever want to spend your life if you're trying to live out a purpose that is in alignment with your God-given gifts. So as a Christian, there's a lot of different ideas out there about God's timing. You know, there's this idea you don't want to get in front of God and essentially, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is go before him before doing what he's called you to do. We've seen that throughout the Bible. And then there's another group of people that just don't move at all. Mm -hmm. How do we balance after we figure out what we're called to do by choosing it? Mm -hmm. How do we go about understanding God's timing to operate in it? Or do uh, we just pick those gifts and we consistently operate based off of, say, those five black sheep, and then yeah. over time, that will grow into what that calling is? So what I'm, the first thing I'm going to tell you is that God's timing is God's timing, period. And there's nothing that you can do that will affect it. Um, you might try to do something, but it's not changing God's timing, <laughs> Right. So the idea of, of affecting God's timing in some way, shape or form, that doesn't, I don't believe that that's possible. And so the idea is rather than worry about God's timing, why don't you worry about honoring the gifts that he gave you, honoring those things that matter most and that the way in which you honor it will change every single day. But the idea here is you've got to figure out what those things are and choose a purpose that will allow you to stay committed to them and then when those two things are there, how you honor them changes every single day. Every day becomes mission, right? It becomes you part of your mission. And I don't care if that's at the grocery store or if that's at a you know third world village somewhere with no running water. It doesn't change you honoring those gifts that God gave you. And so for me, that's really what it's about. You've got to discover these things. You've got to choose that purpose that leans on those things. Because when you do that, that's how you stay committed to what you want to achieve. If you are trying to stay committed on things that are not non-negotiable, you will find a thousand different excuses to take you in a different direction. Hmm. So, the reason why I feel mildly dumbfounded is because I just am. Um, I look at what you've been saying. I, I've been taking notes here and I think, I mean, you, I, I look at my life and I can see many areas in my life where, where I have absolutely winged it, mm -hmm. um, and expected greater things than what actually happened in terms of, of calling. Mm -hmm. I felt, I feel like it more chose me than I choosing it from a very young age where I just feel like I heard the voice of God and it's like, okay, mm -hmm. that's it to 
and this is something that you said, you know, there's nothing that you can do to affect God's time. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm struggling here a little bit because I feel like I've seen examples where, where people have screwed up God's time, not because, or God just changed the gift or placement of that or how he wanted to maybe futuristically do something based off of the behavior or the actions of what one may or may not have done. You know, I look at Jesus in the Bible when, you know, he kept saying, it's not my time. It's not my time. But then his mother says, Hey, turn water into wine, please. You know, he says, it's not my time, but then he does it anyway. Um, so I'm trying to reconcile this idea of, God's timing versus not being able to affect it. If you can elaborate on that. Sure. So uh, the best example I can try to give you uh, for something like this, I'm going to talk to you about Jairus. Um, so Jairus uh, in the Bible is uh, comes into play right after Jesus walks on water. Right. Mm-hmm. And so Jesus walks on water. He calms the storm. Um, He is in this boat. He gets to the other side of the river and he is met by a man named Jairus. And Jairus meets him with a request, which is my child is dying. My daughter's dying and I need you to go heal her. So Jesus says, yes. So they turn around and they start to walk towards Jairus's house. However, they are met with a massive crowd, all of them trying to get Jesus's attention. This is where the woman touches his cloak uh, and he heals her. This is where there's about three different things that happen before he can actually get to Jairus's house. Now, I um, identify with Jairus so much because my son, my oldest son, Uh, was diagnosed with a rare blood cancer in 2012. And all I wanted was God to heal him. And I wanted it done quickly. And the idea that this story is, is that all Jairus wanted was for Jesus to go directly to the house and heal his child. But that wasn't what happened. You see, Jesus had his own timing. And so he was able to heal this other woman. He was able to be in this crowd to have this conversation. And as Jesus finally approaches Jairus's house, they come out and they say that it's too late. She's dead. And Jesus says, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. And he goes in and he raises her from the dead. This idea that you can control or influence God's timing. um, I think that's a perfect example that you cannot That doesn't mean that you can't make horrible decisions in your life that have negative consequences, but that has nothing to do with God's timing. It has to do with bad choices. And so the idea, you didn't, you didn't change God's timing. (laughs) You made a bad choice. His timing is still his timing. And so this idea that we have to be uh, ready to just honor and serve and allow God's timing to be God's timing is really what's most important. He did not heal my son in the timing that I wanted it to happen. My son survived, but here I am eight years later with him still battling this fight in different ways, shapes, and forms. So um, I can be sour over God's timing and I've done everything possible to try to influence that. But to be honest with you, it's had zero effect. What I had to do is understand that it's none of my business. It's God's business. And my job is to honor the things that he asked me to honor, to choose a purpose that's in alignment with that, and then to figure out how I'm going to honor it on a daily basis in everything I do, whether that's at work, whether that's at church, whether that's with friends, it doesn't matter. The mission is the mission. And so the idea here is we have to understand that we've been given this gift, these things that make us the unique individual that we are, that 100% authentic creation. We have to honor those things that make us unique. And when we do, we honor God. 
And when we choose a purpose that says, I'm going to honor these things, we are literally shining his light in everything that we do. And when we do that, we can have the type of impact to bring the good news to everyone who needs to hear it. But this idea that we can screw up God's timing, we don't have that kind of power. I'm sorry. I just don't believe it. That's going to have to be some more thought because what I'm taking away, and this kind of leads into the second chapter of the book, is that you can maybe make bad decisions that alter life based off of consequences, but ultimately, regardless of the situation, that God's timing will happen when he wants it. So let's let's go into the second chapter then about making good decisions and how that affects the calling and affects the five black sheep and in, in life. Uh, because, you know, I, one of the best things that we can do is make good decisions consistently, mm-hmm. you know, and I think oftentimes we overestimate what we can do in a year, but underestimate what we can do in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of the second chapter of Mm -hmm. being a good decision maker, what would you say Mm -hmm. are some of the attributes, the lessons or the keys to making decisions that are good for lasting Mm -hmm. success? Well, my first question, Evan, would be, what's a good decision? What do you consider a good decision to be? Ooh, personally, um, I've never thought about that. Mm -hmm. I guess I just kind of try to wing it with my moral compass. Um, How do you determine if it was good or bad? I think I look at things in the scope of morality, um, sin or not sin, is it in is it an indifferent decision? How did I treat my spouse? How did I treat my children? Is this appropriate for watching? Yes or no? So for me, I look at good decisions based off of the lens of morality. Um, if I take that lens off and try to use a different one, I haven't thought about a different lens. What about at work? You're you're out there selling houses. How do you know if you made a good or bad decision? Time. <laughs> <laughs> time will time, tell me <laughs> time will tell you what if i made a good decision or not oh. how how is time going to tell you based off of the results ah see there's the answer <laughs> yeah mm. you've fallen in you've fallen into something called outcome bias it's the outcome bias trap right and this is where most people are and it's why there's a chapter in the book that talks about it uh, unless your name is is merlin or uh you know glinda or gandalf you do not possess the power to control outcomes i am sorry you do not you only control the uh, ability Uh, to control the deliberate intention that goes into making a decision. But you cannot control an outcome. And so if you are determining whether something is good or bad based on an outcome, so in the essence, even time, time has nothing to do with whether a decision is good or bad. That is still based on some type of outcome. That is literally what behavioral scientists call outcome bias, where you try to use an outcome to justify whether a decision was good or bad, and the science does not support that. So what we have to do is say a good decision is actually one that is born from these black sheep values, these non-negotiables. It considers all of the facts we can get our hands on, and it honors what we're feeling in the moment. If we've done those three things, we've made a good decision regardless of the outcome. The outcome does not matter. And so the idea for this is that we have to take the onus of happiness, good or bad, off of an outcome or result and place it on honoring these things that matter most. That is the definition of a good decision, in my opinion. I'm pausing because I'm thinking about some things in my own life and how much of what you just said brings freedom to some areas of hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, back in 2012, I made a decision with my wife to move to Phoenix, Arizona to help plant a church. Okay. Three months later, we moved back. It was terrible experience. 
Mm-hmm. Um, we just didn't really connect well with the pastors that we were trying to help. Um, mm-hmm. We didn't feel appreciated. And there were some other issues relationally. And mm-hmm. we gave up a lot to help plant this church. Yep. And when we got back, there was that, oh, well, you just made a bad decision. Well, because of the results weren't good. Right. And you're absolutely right. I think in my life, I forgot how you termed that, but based on results would let me know whether or not the decision was good. And mm-hmm. so uh, to me, I missed God. I made a bad decision. I spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. I was in a car wreck. I mean, just, mm-hmm. we went through terrible heartache. We, mm-hmm. we didn't get to move back to our house right away because we rented it out. Mm-hmm. And so there were a lot of domino effects that told me this was the wrong decision. Mm-hmm. At the same time, at the same time of all that, I hear this small voice, but Evan, you can never go wrong with trusting God and putting everything on the line for him. Mm-hmm. And so I've been struggling with, with just this, I, I shouldn't say struggling like on a daily basis, but there's this war of two stories in my mind that says, no, you made a bad decision. You missed God. And the other one was like, you moved to Phoenix to plan a church. You left a mortgage, both of you with no house, no plants, but sheer faith, which was probably mm-hmm. stupid faith. But which one was right? And because I was making it based off of results, I therefore was wrong. Mm. Yeah. And you're, so you're experiencing the struggle of winging it, you know, when you are winging it and you don't know what your non-negotiables are, you can't reconcile that in your head because you Mm -hmm. have nothing to hold it accountable to. But if you knew what your non-negotiables were and you asked yourself your question, did the move honor those things? And the answer was yes. Then the outcome doesn't matter. Now, if you would have violated one of those non-negotiable values in the move, that's a different story. But at least you have something that you can point to specifically and say that this was the culprit of why I feel this way. But when you don't, it's really hard to get your brain to reconcile something like this when you can't use an outcome. Because what are you going to use if you can't use an outcome to justify? You have to use these things that are your non-negotiables, these values that are purely 100% yours and no one else's. Those are what you look to to go, okay, did the move honor these five things? Yes. Did I sort of take in all of the information and facts that I could before I made the decision? Yes. Did I honor what I was feeling in the moment? And if the feeling was you were being called, then yes then you, did a, you, you actually made a fantastic decision that has nothing to do with the outcome. It does not taint the experience. I know you want it. You can easily make that happen in your brain. But I'm telling you, if you did those things, you made a good decision. I have made lots of crap decisions in my life with fantastic outcomes. That doesn't mean I should reward myself for those things, right? Right. I've also made really good decisions that have had horrible outcomes. It's the decision-making that I control, not the outcome. And so in that light, don't hold yourself accountable to that, brother. You need to let that go. You need to let all of that outcome stuff go because you have no control over it. Listen, even if it was a good, if it was a good outcome in, in what you're trying to use, I have news for you. It doesn't change whether you honored your values or not because the outcome isn't part of the equation. And that's what you have to let go. And it's really hard to let go of those things when you don't know what matters most. Yeah. Because what are you holding on to? You know, as an entrepreneur um, in real estate, that is a very hard pill to swallow because then it takes this idea I don't want to say it takes the idea of personal responsibility out of the table, but Mm -hmm. what it does is it takes the outcome Mm -hmm. out of your control. Mm -hmm. And if you're going for a specific outcome and you don't get it, then Mm -hmm. it becomes harder to measure that by in the terms of entrepreneurship and business. But I, on a spiritual deeper, deeper level, I hear what you're saying. But I have news for you. 
in the person in the in the professional side as a realtor, I would rake you over the coals if I do not see evidence of your flock of five in your content creation. You know, you can do everything you want to do. You can sit there and post a house for sale, put it on MLS, put it on all of those different places, advertise it to the cows come home. If it doesn't sell and you did everything right, is it your fault? Is it a bad decision? Did you make a bad decision if it didn't sell? No. The only bad decision would be if you just did what everybody else does and that was it. You possess these things that make you this unique creation, which requires you to provide unique contribution, which means everything that you post should have evidence of at least one or more of these black sheep values. That's what makes it authentic. That's what makes it resonate like a bug to a bug lamp. When you are only spitting out what everybody else is doing, it doesn't allow you to stand out from the crowd. So here's the interesting thing with black sheep, brother. Farmers, while they don't value black sheep like they value the rest of the flock because their wool can't be dyed, it doesn't mean they don't possess any value. Farmers just use them in a very different way. So they keep one black sheep for every hundred white sheep in their care as a marker. So every morning a sheep farmer wakes up, they look out over their flock. If they've got 500 sheep in their care, they should see five black sheep. If they don't see the five black sheep, they know something is wrong. It's famine, it's wolves, it's disease, it's something. But it's the black sheep's ability to stand out from the 495 other sheep that look exactly the same that gets the farmer's first look every day. If you want your client's first look, you better be leading with those black sheep values that makes you the unique original that you are. If you don't, what on earth makes you think you're going to be any different than the 495 other sheep that look exactly the same? Mm. Those 495 other realtors that are doing the exact same thing as you. What makes you unique are those values and those values need to be present in your content creation or you're simply giving somebody a reflection of what matters to them and it has nothing to do with you. You're Normally I am way more talkative, but you're giving me so many good things to just think about that, you know, there's creating dead airspace here. Mm-hmm. You know, I look back at, let's say the past 10 years after I've graduated Mm -hmm. and not fully knowing what my black sheep are. I'm I'm actually going to go take this test here after you and I talk. Great. But I look at areas which seems like failures, which seems like mistakes And when I put that in the lens that we're now discussing, Mm -hmm. it puts it in a new perspective that Mm -hmm. in terms of just failure, pain, and hurt, not only do I try to take away lessons from that, but it also takes the idea away of that these are failures that these are reasons why I'm not qualified. It takes away excuses. Mm-hmm. So what you're, just, what you're describing um, happens in a, on a couple of different levels, right? So this idea of you've sort of held yourself to this standard for years and you've judged yourself as to whether or not you've been successful or not based on these outcomes. But when it comes down to it, when you discover these things, so what if, after you take this assessment and you prove that these are indeed your flock, that when you go back and I, and, and sort of uh, analyze those different scenarios, you realize that you actually honored all of the things that you were supposed to do and the outcome has nothing to do with it. What if you did all the right things and you made all of the right idea choices when it comes to honoring the things that matter most to you? See, what ends up happening is when people take this assessment and they get their flock of five, what we know now after thousands and thousands of people have taken it is that two or three of them are without question 100% authentically real. And you can give me 20 examples of each as to why they are. But we also know that two or three of them are complete fabrication. They are either who you want to be 
or maybe who somebody told you you should be or somebody else's sheep altogether that you've been caring for for whatever particular reason. And so when that's the case, I deal with a lot of people who don't necessarily like themselves all that much or feel less than in a particular area of their life. And my question is, now that you know that even when you get to your initial flock of five, that two or three of those answers are simply not true. How do you know that the person that you don't like is actually you? Because if those aren't your sheep, they're not you. So what if the thing that really is rubbing you the wrong way is that there is no evidence in your life for these things that you are telling yourself are the most important things to you when indeed they're not? When you go to track them and prove that they exist, there is no evidence because they're not your sheep. So this idea of getting to the truth is paramount for you to be able to look through a proper lens as to what you've done in your life and if you are honoring those things or not. Do you know who Craig Westoff is? I don't think I do. Uh, he worked for K Love. He was a radio DJ. Um, mm-hmm. Amazing voice. Mm-hmm. So I want to combine what you're saying with what something he said for our audience that is following my specific journey. You know, we make these idea, these ideal versions of ourselves of who we want to be. And he said, it's idolatry towards God and self-hatred because we have a hard time loving who we are, where we're at, because we're not in that picture perfect version, which is actually creating an idol. And that's why it's idolatry. Yep. Then I take that concept of one reason why I've struggled in my life with personal growth and wholeness and well-being is because I didn't know how to love myself through the process of change. Sure. And when that understanding and revelation came, I started seeing significant changes because I started being able to love myself with who I am and where I'm at. But Mm -hmm. now couple that with what you're Mm -hmm. saying is taking an inventory of my black sheep and the core Mm -hmm. values and learning how to make decisions based off of those. Because even in the process of loving yourself through the process of change, you still can have a false identity of who Mm -hmm. you're trying to become or who you are without Mm -hmm officially um, identifying your core values and then learning how to make decisions based off of those. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, there's a core value of mine that um, I've had since 2008 and I didn't know it was a core value until about uh, a year ago. And for me, I asked God what he wanted me to do with my life. You know, because mm-hmm. I wanted to be a pastor, an author, a, a teacher, speaker, traveler, do all this stuff. And it's like, what vocation? Just just tell me and I'll go do that. And I felt like he said it'll look different at different times in your life, but the heart mm-hmm. will remain the same, which mm-hmm. is living out the heart of God by loving mm-hmm. others back to life. Mm-hmm. And I wish I could say I'd make every decision based off of that. I don't. Um, I'm getting better at it, mm-hmm. but I still need to take into consideration, not just that calling, Mm -hmm. but then establishing these five sheep around that, if I'm understanding you correctly. Yeah. So I've, you know, I feel like many of us, um, we shortchange God in a lot of ways. Right. And so listen, if you hear uh, God's voice tell you to do something very specific, you should listen to that, right? I, I believe that with my whole heart. But I also believe that sometimes we we um, alter God's voice to, to meet our needs. Yeah. And, and so the idea is, what if, rather than, than listening for a specific thing that you are supposed to do, I want you to do X, And that X is be a pastor. That X is be a missionary. That X is whatever it is. What if it was, I've given you these gifts and I need you to care for them. And I need you to do that in honor of me. And I need you to do it in my name. 
if we discover these things and we honor them on a daily basis, then does it really matter what you're doing? Does not every action become part of your mission? So whether you're slinging burgers at McDonald's, you are working a forklift at a warehouse or you're the CEO of a billion dollar company, that doesn't matter because the purpose is the purpose. Now you're just looking at it. You're looking at the how. It's just the how, right? It's It's more about who you are versus what you are. Correct. And so this idea that we have got to discover what these things, these unique traits are, these values that God has said, this is what makes you different than everybody else on the planet. And then you need to use those to choose that purpose. Now, I'll tell you something that happens a lot when when people do this assessment, especially Christians, is they put faith as one of their values. I get it. I get it. I have no idea what you mean by that. I have no idea. It's such a huge word that my encouragement is always to define what you mean when you say faith. Because I promise you, it is different for every person that's out there. Even people who are are members of the same religion, it means something different. And so for me, faith was one of my first ones that I had to go back and go, It's too subjective. It's too subjective. So faith to me became hope, impact, and empathy. That's the actionable items that come out of what I mean when I say faith. I've got to lead people with hope. I've got to lead with hope. I've got to have that desired impact. And I've got to know that I'm going to walk a mile in someone's shoes so that they will listen to what I have to say and not just show up you know, spouting something off with no investment in their life whatsoever. So for me, that is my faith actionized is hope, impact, and empathy. So I promise you when you go to take this, and I know if you're like most, we'll end up with faith in your five. That's great. I get what you mean, but I don't think you get what you mean. Mm -hmm. And so you need to define what faith means to you. And can you find those words that make it real rather than this nice looking rubber stamp that you can plunk down and feel good about yourself that you just wrote faith? Makes sense. It's not easy. You know, as I, as we're having this conversation, it honestly takes a very vulnerable conversation for for oneself, a lot of self-awareness, maybe talking with others. What is that process like <laughs> to being able to grow that? hundred percent, brother. hundred percent. Listen, there's a chapter in the book called the bone crushingly honest conversation, right? And that's because that's what it feels like. It's what it feels like to have. It is incredible. I think people feel like it is really hard to be a hundred percent honest with someone else, but I believe it's hardest to be a hundred percent honest with ourselves, way more hard than, than having a conversation with somebody else. So in that light, you know, the book uh, gives some advice from John Wooden, the, uh, you know, legendary coach from UCLA, uh, basketball coach, uh, it came from Don Yeager, who is sort of one of his disciples, um, listened and was uh, mentored by John Wooden for, for a decade, you know, uh, arguably one of the greatest leaders we've ever had in the United States. And, um, you know, what, what coach Wooden would have this person do is every year he would have a Don sort of take account of the most influential people in his life. Who are the five people you spend the most amount of time with at work? Who are the five people you spend the most amount of time with in your personal life? And who are the five people that you spend the most amount of time with in that other category where it's, maybe it's volunteer work, it's church, it's whatever it might be. Um, you need to take those 15 people and figure out who your inner circle is going to be for the next year. Who are the five amount of people, uh, five people you're going to spend the most amount of time with. You're going to devote the most amount of time to in the next year. And it's a tough, that is a tough 
process of pruning, right? Because the question you need to ask yourself is, are they going where you're going? Are they headed in the same direction you're headed? If the answer is no, then they can't possess one of those five slots in your inner circle. It's that important. You will never outperform your inner circle, ever. And so this idea is discovering who those people need to be. And every year, you're going to see some change in that. It's not going to be the same people every year. People grow, people change, people do lots of different things and and you change and you grow. And now you've got to find these places where people have experienced or can lead you in the direction that you want to go if you want to continue to have progress. But the hardest part of being an entrepreneur is coming to the crossroads where the people who got you where you are are not the people to take you where you want to go. There is no more difficult scenario that I can think of because these people you love, they're family. But if they're not capable of taking you to where you want to go, you have to readjust the time allotted to those relationships so that you can continue to grow and fulfill what God wants from you. Mm. And that is tough. You know, Jim Rohn has a quote, you are the average of the five closest people around you. And that's, you know, in part why I started the podcast is because I wanted to be around people like you. And as a guy who wasn't offering anything or doing anything but real estate at the time, I had no way of connecting with people like you um, or that have been on the show unless if I could create value. And so I decided since I wanted to talk to you and others, I had to create something of value that, that was interesting and beneficial to them and attractive. And I gotta say like this lesson that you're talking about has, is kind of been one of the lessons this year that has been really subconsciously happening. Mm -hmm. Um, One, I mean, because I think COVID had a big part of that, Sure. Uh, but the other thing too is, you know, there's a few people that I've intentionally um, not, I just separated myself from no, no ill will, like nothing happened, yeah. but I, mindset is we were in different spots and I, I wanted more. And Good for you. So I'm, I'm seeing some of this stuff take place already. Um, mm-hmm. Moving forward, because I feel like I'm in a place where I have a lot of great one, one-off conversations, but I need to redevelop that inner circle. Mm-hmm. And I need to be, I want to be intentional about it, but I want to be intentional about it with people that are where I want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe I'm being a little pessimistic here. How do you create enough value for those people and those relationships to want to be in relationship with you? Because I've reached out to many people and I've been Mm -hmm. rejected a lot and I'm fine with rejection. Mm -hmm. But if I'm wanting to develop this new core five, Mm -hmm. I mean, how how does it happen? And I just, I'm, I'm really curious. You need to become our first look. What do you mean by that? You need to lead with those things that make you completely unique. Those black sheep values, just like the farmer gives the black sheep their first look, you need to lead with what makes you uniquely different. And that's going to get people like me, it gets our first look. As opposed to the, trust me, I've done 495 different podcast interviews in the last two months over this book. But what gets me to say yes, first is to find that unique thing that I can look at and go, that's a conversation I want to have. That's something that's different than all of these other things that are going to ask me all the same questions. And I'm just going to be spewing out the same interview over and over and over again. If you want to do something different, then bring it. Bring it, lead with it, and let me choose if that's something that I'm going to engage with or not, rather than lull me into this, another another podcast interview, another way to just, you know, this has been a completely different conversation than any other podcast I've done in the last two months. Completely. 
score is right. <laughs> I'm actually, this is the most fun I've, <laughs> I have to be careful, but this is one of the, I'm just going to tell you, it's the most fun I've had in the 495 other freaking interviews I've done because we're not talking about the same stuff, right? You're talking about some really tough things that really matter. And my deal is this, impact is one of my black sheep values. And I'm not the person that if just one person hears this message, no, screw that. It takes the same amount of effort to impact 100,000 people as it does to impact one. So why settle for one? I am never going to settle for that. God is bigger than that for me. So for me, I'm like, do it, do everything you can. Give me every ounce of it. And so that to me allows us to have this incredible conversation that I hope every single listener that's listening right now walks away going, I got to get my life together. I've got to figure this stuff out because if I don't figure it out, I'm winging it. And if I'm going to continue to wing it, how am I ever going to consistently answer God's call? I I don't know another way. I just don't. Mm. Well, we're coming close to, to the time of our end here. Um, yeah. Before before I, we land this, is there anything mm-hmm. else about your book or about this conversation or question that you want to ask to before we bring this down to, to an end? Well, I would say that one of the big learns for me in this process, it wasn't just discovering these black sheep values and proving that they were real. It was shifting to speaking them into existence, right? It was actually making the shift to not just understanding and knowing, but to literally pulling out my calendar and writing them into my appointments. I would look, and I still do this. I look at at an appointment, what is going on? Who am I speaking to? Which one of my black sheep or more need to show up to maximize the impact of that conversation. And so I put in this effort into every talk, right? So I look and go, does creativity need to show up? I know hope has to show up. It's the very top of my of my hierarchy of values. So that's non-negotiable, but I have to look and do a little bit of preparation with deliberate intention to maximize their ability to impact whoever it is I'm speaking to, as opposed to just winging it and hoping for the perfect moment to share something I'm not going to allow my success to be on winging it, luck or accident. I'm not. I'm going to take control over what I can control. And I'm going to speak these things into existence, not just with deliberate intention, but with passion and belief that this is actually the difference, right? And so for me, learn these things. But if you don't speak them into existence, you will not experience the transformation that's possible. And that is is the ultimate goal, I believe, of all of us is to experience that transformation into the person that we were placed on earth to be. I want to end with the same three questions that I typically end every podcast. What is the best decision you've ever made? Uh, to To define these things. I went 47, almost four, almost 47 years. I was 45 when I actually did the work. So I spent four decades winging it and not experiencing the fulfillment that was possible that God had made for me uh, until I'd finally decided to, to get my stuff together. <laughs> Sorry, almost cussed. No, you're good. <laughs> hey, it's fine. It's fine. It, uh, it occasionally happens on this show. <laughs> <laughs> Get my in, stuff together. Yes. <laughs> yeah. In terms of negative self-talk, uh, yeah. I, I know that that's something I've struggled with and a lot of people struggle with, Yeah. you know, to, to humanize you, what mm-hmm. do you currently struggle in with self-talk? Um, you know, it's, it's, and I've been able to, uh, to battle this pr- pretty well. Uh, over the last couple of years. Um, the interesting thing, I think, is the more success that you have, uh, the larger the imposter syndrome becomes. And so for me, uh, the, the biggest thing that I've had to struggle with is I don't have any letters after my name, like, you know, PhD in organizational development or, or behavioral psychology or any of those things. Right. Um, and so that, that, uh, is a constant deal. It does. So I spend, 
a lot of my life in research, right? And and making sure that I can back up anything I say with science. And that is, um, uh, while I do it, I don't have those recognizable uh, definitions at the end of my name that would make somebody just arbitrarily believe me. And so um, that's probably the, the, the number one thing is that somehow, some way I'm not qualified to be doing this type of work. Gotcha. In terms, well, let me ask you this. What, what brings you peace? Hmm. Uh, living in the present is probably the number one thing for me. I have a tendency to be pulled uh, to the future where uh, uncertainty lives and anxiety. <laughs> and um, You and me both. <laughs> Oh, yeah, right. Uh, so our brains are, are pre-wired from the factory to view uncertainty as a threat. And here's the something that's really important for you to know. Uh, when our brains perceive something as a threat, all it wants to do is diffuse the threat. It doesn't care whether you're right or wrong. So you can be making a really uh, bad decision based on complete falsehoods and your brain's okay with it because it no longer views it as a threat. And so this idea becomes... We really need to pay attention when we are experiencing anxiety and uncertainty um, to allow our, our values to serve as an anchor that pulls us back into the present, as opposed to letting all of that uncertainty in the future sort of uh, swirl us up into an emotional tornado. Mm, makes sense. Yeah. Where can people connect with you? Where can people buy your book? Um, mm. Yeah, so so you can go to uh, findyourblacksheep.com. That has uh, all of the different ways you can buy. You can walk into Barnes and Noble today and buy the book if you'd like. Uh, that's fantastic. You can go to Amazon and and buy it there, or Books a Million, or any of those places as well. Um, you can uh, find all of my speaking engagements from that site as well, my social media profiles, all that sort of thing. It's simply at Brant Menswar uh, everywhere. I'm pretty active on social media. So um, if you want to stay in touch, that's probably the best way to to do it. Perfect. Well, Brant, man, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I really, really appreciated it. Thank you. Uh, brother, thank you for a 100% unique conversation. You need to keep this up. You're doing great work. I appreciate it. Have a great day. You too, brother.